it's really, really wonderful to be back and to, to see faces from, uh, from the 90s, actually, when I was here. And that 1995 colloquium was the first colloquium of my academic life. So it's, it's, it's really nice to be back. And I want to thank everyone who made this conference happen. Uh, it's, it's really an honor to be able to come and share my work with people who've been engaged with the journeys that began and have followed uh, the making of Playing With Fire. So um, I, I'm, I'm very excited to, to be sharing with you parts of my recently completed book. And it's entitled Muddying the Waters, Co-authoring Feminisms Across Scholarship and Activism. And it, in a way, it's, it's sort of engaged, I think, not as much with people who have um, appreciated and admired Playing With Fire, but all, I think more so with, with some of the, uh, the critics of Playing With Fire and trying to kind of you know, really build a conversation where those, those different positions can, can you know, kind of walk together in, in productive tension. So here in this book, Muddying the Waters, I take up the questions of solidarity, responsibility, and location as they have emerged in the context of cross-border work by academic feminists who are working in alliances with social movements. Um, so in this talk, what I want to do is I want, want to first give you a sense of some of the ways in which these questions have been discussed and debated. And then I discuss how these debates and positions can be muddied in productive ways through a praxis of what I call a radical vulnerability that is based on a creative engagement with encounters, conversations, and storytelling. And I'd like to begin with quotations from intellectuals coming from different positions on the question of responsibility, solidarity, and location. The first is from Gayatri Chakravarti Spivak, who formalizes responsibility in the following way. Quote, all action is undertaken in response to a call that cannot be grasped as such. Response here involves not only respond to, as in give an answer to, but also the related situations of answering to, as in being answerable for. It is also when it is possible for the other to be face to face the task and lesson of attending to her response so that it can draw forth one's own." End of quote. The second quote is from El Quilombo Intergalactico, who echoed the critique of the Zapatistas. Quote, the notion of solidarity that still pervades much of the left in the US dresses itself in the radical rhetoric of the latest rebellion in the darker nations while carefully maintaining political action at a distance from our own daily lives, thus producing a political subject, the solidarity provider, that more closely resembles a spectator or voyeur to the suffering of others, while simultaneously working to reduce the solidarity recipient to a mere object. This urges us to accept the narrative that power tells us about itself, that those who could make change don't need it, and those who need change can't make it." End of quote. And the last quote is from Linda Martin Alcoff, who writes, again quote, postmodernism has opened up new ways to diagnose the causes of oppression and to critique domination, but it has also resulted in a confusion about what unites our diverse constituencies and what languages we can use to make demands, just as it has called into question the inability to invoke any we here at all. I believe, she says, we need today to re-invoke that we so that that would include all groups targeted by identity-based forms of oppression. So muddying the waters is about ever-evolving journeys that confront and embrace the messiness of solidarity and responsibility suggested by these three quotations. In describing and analyzing these journeys, frequently through stories and encounters and anecdotes, I seek to both separate and intimately link the question of scholarship with that of political action. With co-authors, collectives, co-artists, and comrades, I engage this relationship without claiming the label of activist scholarship 
and without invoking categories such as transnational, post-colonial, or women of color feminisms as pure bodies of thought that can help us sort through the challenges posed by these journeys. So far from providing a methodological engagement with questions such as how to undertake transnational feminist studies or alliance work across the borders of academia and activism, I am interested in placing question marks on the utility and logic of neat positions and categories. I underscored the necessity of muddying theories and genres so that we can continue to embrace risks of solidarities that might fail and of translations that might refuse to speak adequately. When academic engagement gets logged into pure theoretical positions and loyalties, the possibility and impossibility of solidarity and responsibility is already pronounced, sometimes through their dismissal and sometimes through their celebration as self-contained categories such as deconstructivist theory, postmodernism, or activist scholarship. Consequently, the journeys in and through which the complexities of solidarity and responsibility are felt and struggled with either get relegated to methodological appendices of critical ethnographies, or they become articles on action research, or they are dismissed a priori as invalid or unworthy of academic discussion. Such segregated conversations also serve to reinforce the problematic division between abstract thinking and concrete doing. A related problem arises when the lenses that academics deploy to address questions of epistemic hierarchies betray the logic and investments emanating from our own locations. Structural asymmetries grant metropolitan researchers access to more resources, richer rewards, and control over the means of widespread dissemination of knowledge. This material hierarchy can result in a taken for granted epistemic hierarchy in which metropolitan knowledges are privileged as sophisticated and where non-metropolitan knowledges are perceived as raw data or stories that need to be framed and put into perspective by the formally certified intellectual. At the same time, metropolitan assumptions of privileged understandings are often deflated in encounters with non-metropolitan subjects or interlocutors who may neither acknowledge nor respect this hierarchy and who may be critical of metropolitan academics, their misplaced priorities, or their inadequate frameworks. These politics of location, engagement, and epistemic hierarchies raise several questions. Can notions such as solidarity and responsibility, trust and hope, vulnerability and reflexivity serve a useful purpose in ethically navigating the forms of epistemic violence in which metropolitan academics are and will always remain complicit? Is it possible to ethically navigate this terrain without lumping different kinds of epistemologies and knowledges into simple categories where one is deemed inherently superior and or legible to another? Can such ethics be articulated in ways that do not foreclose an intermingling of stories, truths, and affects on the one hand and commitments to scholarly objectivity on the other? While some scholars have approached these questions through concepts such as sustainable epistemologies, others have framed their arguments in terms of the sites from which scholarship should emerge. For example, Naomi Sheeman's inquiry into the responsibility of the public university underscores the importance of the social contracts that underlie research and discovery, teaching and learning, and outreach and public service of the university and that necessarily involve those who are subject to and, uh, and or are vulnerable to the work of the university. Jane Bennett, in comparison, frames the dilemmas facing Africa-based feminist research by refusing to draw a line between theory as a way of approaching realities and experiences and research methodologies as the how of engaging with those realities and experiences. For a growing number of university-based intellectuals, 
activist scholarship and ethnographies of activism have become important rubrics, commit themselves to making activist scholarship possible as a viable mode of intellectual inquiry and pedagogical praxis. Some politically engaged scholars, in contrast, fear that the creation of a more permanent institutional space for activist scholarship might displace the model of objective, value-free inquiry. For instance, Kamala Vishveshwaran provides the example of Hindu nationalist groups who were active in the school textbook controversy in California to remind us of the multiple meanings of politics and activism. She argues that, quote, Activist scholarship must too, few, must too often presume agreement on what constitutes the political in order to place action on the agenda. And yet, what constitutes the political is radically contingent upon time and place. This is all the more reason to not let an a priori understanding of something called activism or politics unreflexively shape scholarship. Now more than ever, we need a commitment to thinking the political through its multiple guises. To do so, it is often productive to separate, but not detach, the question of scholarship from political action." End of quote. While we may argue whether it is truly possible to separate scholarship from political action without detaching the two, it is worth grappling with the ways in which we might attend to the radical contingencies of time and place while also resisting simplistic assumptions about shared political sensitivities or agendas. Susan Geiger and I have proposed what we call situated solidarities as a way to facilitate this grappling. In attending to the specificities of geographical, socioeconomic, and institutional locations of those who enter into intellectual and political partnerships, and to the particular combination of processes, events, and struggles underway in those locations, situated solidarities resonate with Chela Sandoval's differential consciousness, Carol Boyce Davis's critical relationality, Sarah Ahmed's idea of ethical encounters, and Jody Dean's reflective solidarity. Sandoval's conceptualization of US third world feminisms necessitates differential consciousness as a mode of theoretical engagement that is flexible and tactical in its analyses and intervention based on context and climate. Similarly, Davis's notion of critical relationality allows for what she calls an anti-definitional analytical space in which multiple theoretical positions interact relationally in one's critical consciousness to create possibilities of alliances which recognize specificities and differences. In an analogous vein, Sarah Ahmed calls for deconstructing stra stranger fetishism by working toward an ethics of encounter that seeks to learn without an expectation of fully accessing a stranger's thick histories and complex positionings in time and space, as well as their connections to other places and times that enable such a meeting. This articulation is reminiscent of Jody Dean's vision of reflective solidarity, which envisions feminist solidarity as rooted in two moments, that of opposition to those who would exclude or oppress another, and that of our mutual recognition of each other's specificity. So muddying the waters resonates with and extends these, these and similar understandings by laboring through the concepts and promises of radical vulnerability and love, reflexivity and risk, translation and co-authorship as mutually constitutive in knowledge making and alliance work. In these journeys of the I and the we, defined by situated solidarities, the possibilities of alliances are inseparable from a deep commitment to critique that is grounded in the historical, geographical, and political contingencies of a given struggle. These are journeys enabled by trust with an ever-present possibility of distrust and epistemic violence, journeys of hope that must, must continuously recognize hopelessness and fears, and journeys that insist 
on crossing borders, even as each person on the journey learns of borders that they cannot cross, either because it is impossible to cross them or because it does not make sense to invest dreams and sweat into those border crossings. In a way, Mudding the Waters is an academic <coughs> memoir. I turn the gaze upon myself as a researcher, writer, and cultural worker who has wrestled with critiques of identity and meanings and possibilities of authorship and projects, uh, authorship and politics through academic projects. These, project, uh, these projects have been undertaken across places as diverse as the classrooms of the University of Minnesota, the streets of Dar es Salaam, and the villages of Sitapur district in Uttar Pradesh. Places and the languages in and through which those places either become alive or are rendered invisible or powerless in academic engagement become significant characters in this journey where I grapple with the politics of taking on research sites and making expert knowledges, as well as the politics of leaving places alone when one cannot adequately struggle with one's responsibility to those sites of knowledge making. The next section of my talk is titled Wounded Truths and Troubled Fields. And I present here three excerpts from a co-authored diary written with the members or sathis of Sangatin Kisan Mazdoor Sangatan, which I will call SKMS from here on a peasants and workers movement working in Sitapur district of Uttar Pradesh in North India. And these excerpts provide an entry point into my subsequent discussion of encounters, conversations, storytelling, and radical vulnerability. So the first excerpt from the co-authored diary is called The Boatman and the Pandit. Once upon a time, a learned man who considered himself highly accomplished climbed on a boat. The simple boatman respectfully welcomed him. As the boat started sailing, the pundit asked the boatman, hey, do you know anything about capitalism? The boatman folded his hands. I am an illiterate man, sir. How would I know about capitalism? What's the point of living in such darkness? You have wasted 25% of your life, the learned man pronounced. As the boat sailed further, the pundit was once again ta taken by an urge to establish his intellectual authority. So you're a laborer, I'm sure you've heard of Marxism. Where would I learn about that, Sahab? I have no clue what Marxism is. What a pity, you have ruined 50% of your life. But you're married, don't tell me you haven't heard of feminism. When the boatman expressed his ignorance of feminism too, the, the pundit declared 75% of the boatman's life wasted. Before the boatman could respond to this, this declaration, the boat began to sink in midstream. The boatman said to the scholar, Panditji, you know everything, now swim. But alas, the pundit had not learned how to swim. Panditji, I have merely wasted 75% of my life, but you are just about to lose all of yours. <laughs> Saying this, the boatman quickly swam across the river and the scholar drowned. <laughs> this story is often told by members of SKMS in the villages of, of, of the Sitapur district. And the story is often followed by the question, why didn't the boatman try to save the scholar? If the scholar had not continuously mocked the boatman and belittled his knowledge in existence, there is a good chance that the boatman would have extended his hand to save the scholar and perhaps the knowledges and lives of both the men could have been saved. If we agreed that each one of us is part pundit and part boat person, there would be very little to hold in place the walls that separate certified intellectuals from the authors of everyday lives and struggles. Unfortunately, however, our world is inflicted with, with a system where the gaps between the pundit and the boat person become vehicles to reinforce differences of caste, class, gender, race, and place who becomes the subject of knowledge and who is designated as the pundit to produce, legitimate, and disseminate that knowledge? And what are the implications of this inequality? Raising these questions in the context of the politics of rural development and women's empowerment, nine Sangatins, or close women companions in Avadi, began a journey as writers in Sitapur in 2002 
a journey that first acquired the form of the book, Sangatin Yatra in Hindi and Avdhi, and subsequently evolved into SKMS, a movement that now comprises several thousands workers and peasants, both women and men, over 90% of whom are Dalit. Grappling with the nuances of class, caste, gender, and communal differences in relation to development with capital D, this journey is, on the one hand, committed to securing livelihoods and right to information and to ensuring water supply to a dry irrigation channel for the Sathis of SKMS. On the other hand, in linking the issue of socioeconomic disempowerment of the poor with their intellectual disempowerment, this journey poses the question of who determines target populations, issues, and activities for projects of empowerment and how. Who keeps the, the accounts of these activities and for whom? And how do the coordinators of these projects in becoming the experts on the disempowered contribute to maintaining the status quo? As Sathis go through their own soul searchings on these issues, we also explore ways in which connections between intellectual labor and grassroots organizing can be deepened, and how the realities of socio-political and intellectual hierarchies, as well as the very definitions of who and what constitutes the margins, can be troubled and transformed. That was the first excerpt. The second excerpt from co-author diary is called Rethinking Here and There. And it begins with a, a quote from one of my colleagues in the movement. Her name is Richa Singh, her diary that she wrote in the US in 2007. So the quote begins, Syracuse, 6th April, 2007. For some women traveling from what some would call the third world of the third world, this is Surbala's and my 11th day in the United States. Surbala, Richa Nagar, and I were supposed to leave Syracuse and reach Minneapolis today, but we couldn't. The gathering that some of our supporters had planned in Minneapolis was canceled. Northwest Airlines stopped 12 passengers from boarding the overbooked flight today, and the three of us were part of that group. And then began Richa Nagar's four hour long fight with the representatives of the Northwest <laughs> Airlines. A, a fight in which Surbala and I could not participate verbally because we did not speak English. It was a fight in which no one screamed with anger, but where an extremely tense argument with clinched, clenched jaws and hostile glances went on forever. I remembered many dharnas or sit-ins. This was also a dharna a civilized dharna in a land of so-called civilized people. <laughs> the three of us remained solid in our protest, but I could not help thinking what would have happened if only Surbala and I had been traveling today. Everything that happened today broke my confidence to travel alone in America. The long, hard journey from Delhi to Minneapolis began to seem easier. The, the humiliation that we live today has sharpened my perspective. She carries on uh, with, the, with the diary. In a world defined by casteism, I come from the category of discriminating castes. I have never been subjected to the humiliation that a Dalit experiences, and even with my lower class background, I have enjoyed the benefits of my caste privilege without desiring them. I had known that race discrimination exists, but now I'm seeing and feeling it. I'm beginning to recognize the expressions of those eyes, which sometimes seem to be struggling to come out of their temptation to discriminate, and at others seem trapped in the confidence of their assumed superiority. I keep realizing the ways in which Surbala's and my racial difference makes us weak here, the ways in which it invites others to insult us. It's not simply a matter of our color. It's a matter of our color that is intensely differentiated by its class, its language, its accent, its clothing, its walk, its smile. This discrimination is more dangerous than caste discrimination because it is one that begins with the eyes. It is not that the pain of caste discrimination is any less than this, but racial discrimination seems so quick and so dangerous, just like the automatic doors of this country. They open and shut with a speed that leaves us stunned. At least for us, this speed is terrifying. And quote from Richa, Richa Singh's diary ends here, and the excerpt continues. 
Between late March and early May of 2007, Richa Singh and Surbala crossed multiple borders between Satnapur, Sitapur, Lucknow, Delhi, Amsterdam, and Minneapolis so that they could spend five weeks in the USA participating in a series of academic and activist forums that focused on discussions of Sangatin Writer's book, Playing with Fire, and the movement building work that emerged from our Hindi book, Sangatin Yatra. This border crossing into the US post 9-11 was one of the hardest trips that Richa Singh or Surbala had ever taken anywhere. It inflicted humiliations and silences that they had not encountered before. And it produced tensions and tears among three Sangatins whose audiences, despite best intentions, could not escape the desire to judge who among us was the most authentic Sangatin. The nonstop turbulences throughout this trip led us to reflect, argue, analyze, and travel across many borders in ways that we found generative for the future of our alliance. For example, the three full-time organizers, Richa Singh, Surbala, and Reena, who were working mainly with Dalit women and men to build SKMS in the villages of Sitapur in 2005 and 6, came from the southern or upper castes. And this reality became an important focal point of the collective critical reflexive work of SKMS around caste and gender. Richa Singh's and Surbala's stark confrontation with racism in the US helped to deepen this reflexivity by triggering an embodied awareness of race and caste in ways that none of us had approached before. On the one hand, we appreciated how our different environments construct casteism and racism. On the other hand, the process of jointly inhabiting and inhabiting and experiencing particular spaces and places in the US heightened our awareness of how power operates in those contexts with which we took our intimacy for granted. In her diary, Richa Singh wrestles with her experience of racism through her knowledge of caste. As a lower class member of one of the discriminating castes, she grapples anew with the implications of caste-based politics as she tries to make sense of her, hitherto, of her hitherto unknown experience of racialized othering. She feels that racial discrimination is worse than caste-based discrimination, even as the stories told by Sathis of SKMS make the trauma of casteism unforgettable for her or anyone else associated with SKMS. And this is a point to which Surbala, Richa Singh, and I return again and again throughout our time in the United States. Rethinking and articulating the dreams and struggles of SKMS while breathing and moving in the socio-political spaces of the US reshape our understandings of race and caste, of belonging and citizenship, of borders and border crossings. These spaces also make us acutely aware of how progressive North American audiences judge our authenticity as members of a collective. Whose experiences of marginalization are definitive after all? Who should be authorized to speak about those experiences, to whom and when? Who is the true representative of an alliance? This phase of our journey also raises questions about intimate structures of power, about how we understand the politics of speech, representation, solidarity, and agenda setting in a movement. Grappling with this and similar questions become part and parcel of our commitment to trouble the dominant meanings of the field and of seeing our here's and our theirs as thoroughly intertwined. And the third excerpt from the co-authored diary is called Ghungats and Withdrawals. In a restaurant in Delhi, a friend from SKMS and I are in a discussion with two feminist scholars. The SKMS Sati shares that despite repeated efforts to end segregation between women and men in the monthly meetings of SKMS, quite a few women cover their faces with ghungats and choose to sit separately from the men. This narration immediately draws a sharp response. One of the scholars questions, the S questions SKMS members' desire to see uh, women out of the ghungats. She's asked, why for, and for whom is segregation a problem? 
The SKMS member is taken aback, not because the questions surprise her, but because she's known to pose precisely similar questions before others who, whom she deems guilty of simplistic assumptions about rural women's oppression. Since I know the SKMS member well, I can sense that she made this comment about the Gungats in the hope for initiating a more complex discussion about the dilemmas of organizing women and men in the current phase of SKMS's struggles. However, the reaction that her comment triggered makes her silent. She withdraws. I want to prove to the other two academics that SKMS's engagement with feminism is more nuanced than what they have assumed. I give the example of the theater workshop of SKMS, where seven men and five women shared the space of a room for five days and five nights, and where the intimacy of the process led to incidents that could shock those who make quick assumptions about the oppressions faced by rural women of Uttar Pradesh. I tell them about Radha Pyari, who on the third day of the rehearsals refused to enact a scene of domestic conflict with Sri Kishan and stated flatly, I cannot put my heart into this role. I'm not attracted to Sri Kishan. The person who's assigned the role of my husband reminds me of my father-in-law, so what can I do? <laughs> <laughs> the faces of the men listening to Radha Pyari turned red. A woman in the group asked, so whom do you want, Radha Pyari? Manohar, said Radha Pyari, and blushing, Manohar entered the scene and Shri Kishan quietly exited. This second story fascinates our friends. They find it far more interesting than the Gungat story and urge us to write about it. But the SKMS member barely listens. She has checked out completely from the conversation by this time. So these three excerpts help me to get to my next section where I want to discuss how making knowledges through retelling encounters can be part of a praxis of radical vulnerability. In imagining feminist polyvocal testimonials as cross-border reading alliances, Patricia Connolly deploys the idea of truth-telling as tale-telling. Connolly conceptualizes stories as the medium through which fragmented truth claims subtly emerge and get interwoven and reworked to gain a kind of epistemic wholeness. Rather than providing unproblematized truth claims then, storytelling becomes a deliberative exercise in which hesitations and contradictions are rhetorically employed to comment on the limits of memory to convey social knowledge. In the context of the border crossings embraced in muddying the waters, storytelling is enabled through what Hanan Sabia calls encounters and conversations. Sabia critiques the taken for granted and catch all nature of the term transnational and expresses concern about the ease and facility with which the idea of the transnational circulates and thus naturalizes its critical analytical potential. As a possible cleansing practice that can impart some utility to the term, she includes encounters and conversations that take shape from particular locations and positions while simultaneously attempting to traverse compartmentalized and already packaged forms of knowledge. Noting how several of these encounters are products of the shifting locations from which we practice and produce knowledge, Sabea reminds us of Walter Mignolo's articulation of conversation as research method. By conversations, Mignolo does not mean statements that can be recorded, transcribed, and used as documents. Instead, he cites the most influential conversations as people's comments in passing about an event, a book, an idea, a person. These are documents that cannot be transcribed, knowledge that comes and goes, but remains with you and introduces important changes in a given argument. As an entry point into imagining and practicing radical vulnerability, the excerpts that I just shared suggest how conversations can enable or stifle arguments and hopes for dialogue and alliance. They also offer an opportunity to extend and complicate discussions on the politics of location, authenticity, trust, and relevance in cross-border engagements and alliance work, a subject that has triggered passionate discussions for at least two decades. 
More recently, Amina Mama reframes this problem in terms of, and I'm quoting her, she says, the manner in which the politics of location and positionality limit the ability of visiting and expatriate researchers who can hardly ever develop the intellectual, political, and practical connections and everyday knowledge that local activist scholars accumulate and develop through many years of involvement, end of quote. Arguing that the grand theories put forward by Western-based academics are for the most part too general and removed to inform local strategy, Mama argues for creating and building relationships of solidarity and service that can enable outside researchers to overcome some of these limitations. Activism for Mama requires locally-based feminist work, and she says, and I quote, we have a long way to go in developing intellectual solidarities that work against the global systemic political economic inequalities that frame our work regardless of our intentions. While I agree with Mama about recognizing the knowledge that can only become possible through a deep engagement with the local, the co-author diary suggests that in order to realize the possibilities of Alliance work, we must seriously complicate the frequently invoked div division between inside versus outside researchers, as well as the accompanying binaries of global as something that is general and research driven versus local as something that is grounded and activist. A categorizing of investments and abilities of researchers or activists in ways that render some as more authentic or involved than others by virtue of their location or origins can be dangerous. A commitment to cultivate radical vulnerability through situated solidarities demands that we grapple with the material and symbolic politics of our locations and imagine how researchers might play a role in evolving ethics and methodologies that seek to build dialogues across locations. On the one hand, those who wish to enter into difficult long-term dialogues can only do so if the conditions of dialogue allow them to interrogate and to express suspicion of one another. On the other hand, the expression of suspicion and, and interrogation must happen in ways that enhance rather than foreclose sensitive negotiations of experiences and interpretations for it is in precisely in these negotiations that possibilities for shared yearning and dreaming reside. My retelling of certain tales here, then, is an invitation to explore ways of building trust and accountability by becoming radically vulnerable. And this is what I mean by becoming radically vulnerable. If mistakes and complicities with violence necessarily accompany our actions, memories, desires, and locations as representers, then our methodologies must allow all the members of an alliance to become vulnerable before one another about these mistakes and complicities. And, with, and while also recognizing that our ability to grasp or know these can always only be partial and provisional. Only then can we feel brave enough to voice suspicion of each other's desires and interpretations without fearing that such expressions might stifle hopes for Alliance work. This kind of radical vulnerability cannot rely on traditional notions of transparency and accountability in its logic because it is grounded in bonds emerging from multifaceted relationships and trust, in hopes and dreams, in affect. The ethics and methodologies that I'm invoking through radical vulnerability strive to achieve in the realm of research praxis a politics of indeterminacy or a politics without guarantees. If the academy is not the only site of knowledge making, then an opening up of the horizon of theorizing must begin with the recognition that academic knowledges might be enriched through creative conversations with knowledges that evolve in sites of struggle that are distant to the academy, including knowledges that are vernacularized or remarginalized through their contradictory instrumentalization and incorporation in globalized identities, discourses, and projects. 
Such an intellectual project also requires us to appreciate that knowledge claims and truth claims from other locations are often invoked in the form of stories and to pay attention to how we might be listening to or ignoring these stories and the knowledge or truth claims that they make or imply and with what results. At the same time, radical vulnerability hinges on the understanding that any engagement with stories is a politics of negotiation. In reflecting on the possibilities of political theater through Alliance work, Sophie Shank and I have recently argued that deployments of concepts such as subalternity or trans experience by social scientists often betray a desire to demonstrate embodiment or real experience sometimes in a celebratory multicultural mode and at other times in more self-reflexive vein about the marginalization of particular kinds of bodies or lives. But stories can neither reveal the experiences of those they are inspired by, nor can they be imagined as being contained by predefined subaltern or trans identities. Rather, the responsibility and labor of telling stories involves a series of delicate negotiations through which one must underscore the impossibility of ever accessing lived experience. One's engagements with who's speaking, who is referenced, and who is listening can only become legible when contextualized within the shifting so social relations in which those people are embedded. A praxis of radical vulnerability then always returns us to the ethics of how and why we come to a story. The telling of stories must resist a desire to reveal the essential or authentic experience of the subject. Instead, every act of storytelling must confront ways in which power circulates and constructs the relationalities within and across various social groups. This struggle happens as much through what is narrated as it does through the gaps and silences and through that which remains obscured or unavailable within narrative. On the one hand, such praxis struggles to decenter the authors by forging conversations among seemingly disparate sites, languages, texts, and arguments while simultaneously analyzing the ways in which power functions to make these mutually illegible or invisible. On the other hand, such praxis creates texts in and through which co-authors from multiple lo locations can negotiate subalternity and theorize power by strategically staging truths and stories about their evolving encounters and struggles. Such multilocational co-authorship by a political alliance requires that the authors retain a certain amount of control over their intellectual and theoretical production and over the ways in which their texts and stories, as well as their circulation and consumption, can be interpreted as part of the politics of knowledge production. The truths that emerge from the labor of alliance uh, of any alliance underline the forever entangled nature of theory, story, and strategy in co-authoring struggles. Such truth claims are part of knowledge as movement. They cannot be foreshadowed or captured in a schema or model. They can only emerge from processes, from relationships, from encounters, and they can only be identified and retold through anecdotes that are often slippery, indeterminate, subjective, and inseparable from the context in which they are experienced, felt, or uttered. Thus, there cannot be any universal truths or anecdotes that can be verified, falsified, or repeated only an invitation to come up with more truths rooted in more journeys that must continuously unfold. At the same time, of course, there's a basic contradiction here that this whole exercise of rethinking the politics of knowledge making remains undergirded by the fact that it relies on the centrality of the professional researcher who is enabling this decentering of the authors and readers. If the politics of alliance making are about making oneself radically vulnerable through trust and critical reflexivity, if they require us to open ourselves to being interrogated and assessed by those to whom we must be accountable, then such politics are also about acknowledging, recognizing, and sharing our most tender and fragile moments, our memories and mistakes, 
in moments of translation, in moments of love. For it is in the acknowledgement, recognition, and sharing of these moments, memories, and mistakes that we live our trust and faith, and where we often encounter our deepest courage and insights. It is also in these fragile, aching moments that we come to appreciate Alliance work as constituted by fragments of journeys, some fully lived and others abandoned at different stages. Interrupted passages through which the co-travelers recognize the power of becoming radically vulnerable together. These fragmented journeys are marked as much by opening ourselves up to the risks of becoming wounded as they are marked by silences and withdrawals and by returning to forgive and to love again and again. So in the, in the last part of my talk, I present some fragments from the first chapter of Muddying the Waters. It's called Fragmented Translations, Translated Fragments. And here uh, in, in, this, in this chapter, I locate myself in the politics of storytelling by sharing fragments of letters, conversations, poems, and essays. And through this process, I try to imagine ways that can make the researcher writer or reader more radically vulnerable in and through Alliance work. So I'll just share a couple of fragments as sort of a conclusion to the, to the talk. The first fragment is from a letter exchange with Pia Chatterjee, um, and this was in 2010-11. So it's my letter to Pia. Dear Pia, for the last month and a half, I have been enveloped by the fierce power and generosity of your letter. Perhaps the most compelling challenge you have articulated for us relates to the sparks of connection and possibility that cannot always be found through the written word, at least not in our immediate institutional contexts where creative gets morphed into the productive, and even when that creativity seeks to resist the idea of productivity as it has come to be celebrated by our institutions. At the same time, the promise of this continued dialogue, this patching and quilting between us and between fragments of our multiple worlds that haunt us and make us is precisely what makes me hopeful about narration through words, written, imagined, and felt, about sharing pieces in which chaos and dissonance, silence and mourning do not have to be analytically separated, translated, or made visible. Your discussion about the excesses we carry in our bodies reminded me of that seemingly endless moment when I stood at a bus stop in Naitehri, which is a small town in the foothills of the Himalayas, and watched a woman trying to nurse her inconsolable, hungry infant. I could not know how hungry the woman was, but I could see that she did not even try to offer her dry breast to the child in her arms. She continued to thrust a nippled water bottle in the screaming baby's mouth. I stood there with my friend Khajan, streams of milk flowing under my own shirt, for I had an 18-month-old on another continent waiting for me, and my body was responding to this child's call to quench her hunger. However, as a complete stranger accompanied by a man from the area, I couldn't even communicate to the woman the solidarity that I felt in my body. If the people on the cha bagan, the tea plantations where Pia was working, can offer their only protein to you, what stopped me from offering to that baby the protein that I had in excess? That moment from Naitehri has never left me. My need to process it once led to a fragmented poem in Hindi, interspersed with its own translation into English as I struggled to write a non-conclusion to an academic conference paper that I was asked to present in Singapore. But a couple of harsh responses I received from two certified feminists at that conference made me think that I should not communicate with academics through poems again. <laughs> The memories of that child's screams, of the eyes of her mother, of my drenched shirt, and a subsequent conversation with Khajan, and of the feminists who told me how my poem was emotionally manipulative, still howl in my face and make me ask again and again whether we will ever be able to confront the ways in which our bodies enable, complicate, and foreclose our political and theoretical commitments, and the manner in which this confrontation can never yield answers only questions and hauntings. 
Sathis and Sitapur often remark on the well-intentioned middle-class people who visit their villages to support them and who condemn caste untouchability, who condemn, who condemn caste untouchability, but who cannot operate without their own segregated bottles of purified water. Why is this practice not deemed untouchability, they ask. I feel that Sangatins have a sophisticated gauge by which they determine whether or not someone can stand with them and in what ways and for how long. And the ability to eat and drink the same food and water that they are eating and drinking is a very important component of this gauge. I try to do well on the test, but almost always lose my voice due to air and water pollution and sometimes get violently ill with gastroenteritis, at which point I'm generously excused by my comrades for my body's refusal to comply with their standards. All of this keeps me perpetually journeying through the question of what it means to enact solidarity when, like a virus, the germs of my physical, material, and socioeconomic location have made a pakka or concrete house inside my body and made it unable to accept the same conditions of living embraced by those I want to stand, dream, and learn with. Is the body betraying the mind, or is it telling a harsh truth that the mind is refusing to accept? Maybe some of each. But how do we theorize this contradiction and work with it in our beings and in the spaces available to us in, despite, and beyond our institutions? Every act of sharing is an act of translation, an act that contains the possibility of becoming radically vulnerable. It is impossible to know where the sharing might lead us without having taken the risk of exposing that intimate fragment that can only be translated inadequately. The journeys of embracing these risks are journeys of faith. Sometimes they give us, a, sometimes they give us courage to tell more. Sometimes they teach us to withdraw. And at yet others, there's only the inevitability, the inevitability of sleeplessness, hauntings, and tears. The journeys that unfold on the pages of muddying the waters then are as much about what can be said or known in love as they are about the uncertainties that burden love and that make solidarity perpetually fragile and uneven. They are as much about the political economy of truth making as they are about impure truths and polluted genres. They are as much about contaminated knowledges as they are about ruptured intimacies that enable and stifle us. The second fragment that I'm gonna share uh, is actually emerges from a long conversation with uh, some uh, scholar activist friends in Toronto. Uh, a conversation with Oslam Aslan, Nadia Hassan, Ome Salma Rehmatullah, Nishant Upadhyay, and Begum Uzun in Toronto inspired me to think again about my role in SKMS. Can the term scribe capture the work that I often do with SKMS? As someone who does not inhabit the immediate space of the movement all the time, perhaps scribe is exactly what I have been at many occasions. But that is not all, since I, since I am also given, and I also claim, the space in the movement to raise the toughest questions I can think of. This responsibility has come with obvious risks. Yet, I take it seriously, because when a movement is being celebrated as being unique, and successful, it is easy to slip into the same problems that we have been critical of. As somebody who's outside the immediate space of Sitapur then, I try to ask questions that remind the SKMS about these risks and slippages. Why do I think I have the space? Because I have the trust that allows me to carry out this responsibility. For the Sathis can also question my practices, and I'm also available to do what the movement needs me to do. For instance, I can write in Hindi and English for the, for the movement, mobilize resources to advance SKMS's work, help build connections, and mobilize support of various kinds. So in some ways, my role is carved out. At other times, however, I have asked myself and have been asked by academics in the US if my relevance for the movement is over. There was a time when this anxiety led me to repeatedly pose a question before the Sathis. I would say, there's all of this terrific, terrific stuff happening in SKMS, so do you think it's time for me, the academic, to now exit the scene? And Sathis would tolerate this question over and over again 
And after a couple of years, they threw a question back at me. They said, how important do you think you are that you keep talking about withdrawing from SKMS? <laughs> so this is what they told me to do, that stand in the next rally before everyone and say that, oh, you know me, Richa Nagar, I'm so important that I have just decided to leave. Uh, sorry, I can't think of anything that I can do anymore. And to, to receive this response to my anxiety was extremely helpful for me. Um, what the Sathis were teaching me through this question is that anyone who is committed to a struggle will need to find something to do that they know how to do best. That an alliance means that everyone must figure out ways in which they can creatively contribute to the struggle as a whole. Surbala sometimes comes after weeks of organizing meetings and rallies and laboring in the heat for hours and then sits down and embroiders as a way to relax. It is a creative skill through which she expresses herself, and the embroidered material is sometimes sold by SKMS to contribute to our meager organizational resources. Surbala once said, writing to you is what embroidering is to me. My embroidery supports the movement in the same way as your writing does. If my embroidery does not cause a crisis for me, why does your writing cause a crisis for you? <laughs> Surbala's question pushed me to reflect on the ways in which Sathis process the same dilemmas that academics struggle with. It helped me to locate my own labor as a writer in relation to other forms of labor that enable and sustain the movement. And I have the last fragment, which was written in Cape Town last September. My 19th sleepless night in Cape Town. I'm thinking of death how it comes easily and is accepted easily by Sathis in Sitapur. When we met in July, Roshan could not join us for the rehearsals and Sathis said he might not live long. Two weeks later, Kusuma's husband died of an unknown disease before he turned 50. And I received news a few days ago that Radha Pyari's son died of a snake bite in his village because he could not receive medical treatment in time. Deaths that dramatically end life and hopes, yet Sathis often swallow the deepest sorrow uh, of loss by death. There is no desire on the part of Sathis to translate or communicate these sorrows in the scripts that we create together. There is no assumption or expectation that the intimacy or intensity of these sorrows can be apprehended even partially by the currently available registers. What does that say about the discourse of hope that we, the Sathis and their supporters, have collectively refined and mastered in our rallies, meetings, speeches, and writing? Or maybe a praxis of love, hope, and radical vulnerability is contingent upon learning to accept that which cannot enter the realm of translation. Thank you.